Thursday, May 27th at 6.30 p.m. Um, I, I want to start this meeting um, by uh, offering um, our most sincere uh, condolences to the Demers family and all of those who were affected um, by the horrific um, events of last Friday morning. Um, and we're here to discuss um, the event so that our residents um, can have some understanding um, of the process that took place. And we've asked Troop C to be present with us. Um, again, I apologize as I look around. I see Lieutenant Palmer um, from Troop C uh, with us on the line. Mike, if you could unmute him. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, uh, Lieutenant Palmer, can you thank hear me? you. I can hear you. Uh, everyone else, um, uh, we received your uh, um, your email comments, your phone calls. Um, we hear your concerns, um, and it, we want to address as many of them as we can tonight. Um, and in the coming weeks, this is not um, a one-time conversation. I think this will be an ongoing conversation of how we can come together um, to help our community heal um, and and do um, and do better um, in certain aspects. I think we know we can do better in communicating with you, and we're gonna uh, work. I'm going to work um, uh, until we have something that works to communicate with our residents. Uh, we owe that to you. But I want to start with um, if Lieutenant Palmer, if you could kind of give us some um, information on the situation that occurred um, and, and details that you are able to, and then the selectmen may have some questions going uh, from there. Uh, okay. So as it stands at this point, uh, the incident was reported to us at approximately 9.01 Friday morning. Uh, the first troopers were on scene from the barracks within seven minutes. Uh, and uh, upon their arrival, uh, they made a determination that the nature of the injuries and the seriousness of the, seriousness of the incident required a response by the uh, Eastern District Major Crime Squad and the criminal investigative detectives out of Troop C. So they were on scene very shortly thereafter. Um, the victims were transferred, were, were treated at the scene and transferred as quickly as possible to the hospital. Um, and the major crime squad immediately began their investigation uh, in conjunction with the uh, state's attorney out of Tolland, uh, uh, state's attorney Gdansky and GA-19. On the scene at that point were the three sergeants that are responsible for the uh, Eastern District Major Crime Squad, as well as the Eastern District Commander. At the time of the incident occurring, uh, I was not working, but I was in very shortly thereafter because we had another incident in the town of Summers that required command response. So for a period of time during that uh, uh, Friday morning, I was not in Willington, but I was up in Summers. Uh, the investigation was managed by the Eastern District Major Crime Squad. For the balance of that day, they were out there till approximately uh, 4.30 Saturday morning, and information was being developed over the entirety of that time, and it's, it's, it was an extremely chaotic set of circumstances and trying to put hard information to what had occurred to the best of our ability was a challenge. I got to the scene later on in the day after coming from Summers, and they kind of briefed me on what they had currently, and Lieutenant Aello, the Eastern District Commander, he was not available this evening, but uh, he spoke earlier uh, with uh, some of the folks in the uh, in the region at a call this morning. So they were managing the information based on uh, the investigation as it unfolded at the scene. Uh, and one of the things that occurred relatively early on after I arrived was the press conference that occurred at the town hall. And there was a number of social media posts that went out in an effort to try to get the word out as widely as possible. Shortly after I arrived there, we started fielding a significant number of uh, responses from the community at large. Uh, we were we were following up leads on two wheeled motorcycles of every shape and kind from uh, Tolland up to Stafford and into Summers. So it appeared as if the word was out uh, regarding the initial pieces of information that we had. Um, the Troop C had a patrol presence in that area throughout the entirety of the uh, evening into the early morning hours, and then there was dedicated troopers to that area throughout the night. Uh, 
and into Saturday morning, at which time we came out with a significant number of uh, canines. Uh, the number is, is, is uh, we have a certain number of search and rescue canines out there, and I'm not gonna share that number with folks, but they covered approximately just over 1,200 square acres of area uh, in the um, area where we had recovered the motorcycle and uh, some other pieces of evidence out into the, in the uh, woods there. So then on, um, that went all the way, that search went with the search and rescue dogs all the way through Saturday morning into Saturday evening up until dark, where we again maintained a positive presence from the Troop C patrol uh, troopers throughout the night and into the early morning hours. And then uh, Sunday morning, we got the word of a stolen motor vehicle that came back to the town of Willington. And we developed information that led us to uh, Turnpike Road and uh, the situation that occurred there. So at this point, the FBI is involved and throughout the entirety of the investigation, the FBI and other state and local agencies were assisting us in trying to gather information. Uh, the major crime squad was providing updates to the command staff to make them aware of what was going on. And we were getting a tremendous number of um, uh, reports from the larger community about possible sightings of not just the motorcycle up until when we discovered it, but also people walking in the area. And our troopers had a significant number of um, contacts with folks over the course of that time from Friday into Sunday morning. Uh, if someone was walking out there uh, in that area, they were uh, queried by the troopers that were, were patrolling to make sure that we tried to identify folks and see if they had seen or heard anything during the course of their time being out there. So some of the information beyond that is, is uh, investigative in nature and we, we have to keep that uh, out of the larger public uh, sphere at this point in time because um, some of it is unconfirmed, some of it is speculation, some of it is very, very important to the larger investigation. It can't be released to the community at large. Uh, I know I've just recently been reading some articles in the newspaper that seem to purport a number of um, um, a number of pieces of information. Uh, I can tell you after having read that, uh, some of those articles, some of what was in there is coming from sources other than the state police. And because the press can go and interview whomever they like, and those folks are free to share whatever information they believe is accurate, the press can report that as you know, in their article and what they've been told. Whether or not that's accurate would be a different story. And some of the information that may be out there right now, I can tell you is, is probably not accurate uh, or a supposition on folks' part because we don't know some of the whys and wherefores is where we stand right now. I know that's a lot of info. Timelines overlap to a certain degree in terms of when uh, items were discovered and, and uh, the dog tracks are going tonight and rest um, in the area throughout the uh, Friday from the moment the incident occurred until Sunday. Uh, and we're obviously still out there, but we were on scene very quickly. The situation is extremely fluid. We're still developing information as to why uh, the individual in question was in the area and what the intentions of him were at that time. I can't speak to that. I know it's a lot of info. I'll, I'll kind of leave it there and see if uh, it is. If Liza and John, um, I, I'll start with one common theme we saw, um, and hopefully you both had a chance to read all of the um, emails that came in. Uh, there were many, but I assure you all that I, that I've read every one of them and, and hear all of your concerns. The the biggest. Um, theme in, in most of our responses from our residents uh, is why wasn't the uh, reverse 911 used immediately to share information? Um, and if you can help us understand why that wasn't, I think that's, that's probably where we struggle the most. Why wouldn't that have been advised? So the, the early information, if we had done, uh, and I'd like to make sure that everyone knows that, uh, we were in direct contact with Erica 
to the best of our ability throughout the incident. If she had a question, she was free to call me at any point in time during the day or night, and we did speak. So she was advocating on, on the town's behalf, asking questions when she uh, felt the need to, and we were providing her what information we could. Um, in the early stages, any reverse 911 call would have amounted to a description of an individual wearing uh, a certain type of clothing and on a, uh, on a certain kind of motorcycle. And that would, all we, that would be all we would have to give folks at that moment in time. So we didn't have a, a viable description of a person, whether it was a male or a female, whether it was um, you know, what their demographics could possibly be. So in the early stages of that, that information, we didn't have enough information to provide to people in order to give them any sense of what, what to be looking for. Um, and there was also some question at the time as to uh, whether or not that person was, the person could still be in the area. Um, there is a, um, there's a, a point after or leading up to the press conference, which I, I just got in the area at the time the press conference occurred, there's a point up to including the press conference where we were gathering all that information to the best of our ability and that press conference passed that information on. And based on the response from the community, we believed at the time that that word had gotten out there widely enough that people were aware because we were getting multiple phone calls uh, repeatedly throughout uh, the town and to include surrounding towns about motorcycles and, and descriptions of persons walking in the area. So the reverse 911 early on, there wasn't anything for us to provide that would have given folks, um, you know, a, a concrete piece of information to operate with. Uh, and once we started locating pieces of evidence, it got later and later in the night. Um, and the, not being on the scene for the entirety of it, it's hard for me to speak to all the info that was coming into the major crime unit because this is their investigation. So some of what they have, I'm not even aware of because they keep that uh, information for their investigative piece uh, so that if someone reports them some information they can verify based on what they're aware of. So in the immediacy of the moment there wasn't a lot of accurate information for us to operate with and the press conference was our mark uh, in terms of the ability to get the word out to the community about what we had at that moment in time and that from that press conference forward that information was uh, also on social media and it gave us the ability to get information through that platform as well. And we believed at that moment that that word was out there and uh, based on the volume of calls we were taking that people were aware at least of the what we had at that moment in time. Can I ask a question? So yeah, I think um, what we've heard loud and what I, I believe as well, um, was not necessarily the description of the individual if that didn't exist, but the uh, warning for the residents to shelter. I, so personally, I didn't learn of this incident until somewhere around, I was working from home, so I was not on social media. Um, and I didn't learn of the incident until my daughter, who's on a seventh grade group chat, who's 12 years old, heard it from a friend who heard it from a friend. So it, it's not necessarily um, the information of what this individual looked like. It's the fact that the town went so long without knowing that there was somebody who was loose that was causing harm and danger. Um, and that was a risk to the community. I think that's where we are all currently struggling that, um, that, that, that a mechanism wasn't used um, as soon as there was a crime scene that was as violent as it was and the um, perpetrator was not in custody, then why within 10 minutes wasn't the community notified that they should shelter and be careful and that they're, who, we don't know necessarily what he looks like yet, but we know that there's somebody out there that is causing mm -hmm. harm and danger. Yeah, and, and, and as we discuss these things, the, the concerns that you're bringing, I'm, to make everyone clear, we're making note of these things because this feedback is going to be valuable for us in order to come up with a, a plan so that in the future, if information needs to get out, no matter what the nature of it, we can find a, a, a way to get it out there in such a way that it hits the most people uh, uh, within the confines of the area that we're operating. 
So some of that, uh, some of that information wasn't released immediately because there were, we were trying to establish who needed to know about the injured persons and what their immediate needs were for the family. And the major crime unit was conducting uh, their initial investigation as quickly as possible to try and determine what had happened. Um, in this case, and again, I, I didn't arrive till later on, they were trying to do an initial investigation to see whether or not they believed that the individual was actually in the area or if they had fled and um, they had gone from the immediate vicinity. So yes, the, you know, the nature of the incident, um, it, it was um, chaotic, it was dramatic, and some of that initial information, you know, within 10 minutes, and, and we discussed this earlier today, there's no protocol for when um, those alerts would go out. It's, it's one of those things where the, the people that are involved in the investigation and the supervisors there are trying to determine, you know, what is the best course of action and they're multitasking. And uh, it is clear to us now that the, the word did not get out as, as widely as we anticipated it had. And un unfortunately, it never gets out as quickly as, as, as folks would hope it would or uh, they believe they need it to. And that is something that we have to account for as well. So, um, you know, in all the scenes that I've been to over the years, the timing of things is always different, no matter what the nature of the incident. In this case, in order to get clear and coherent information out that wouldn't just cause a panic because there were so many unknowns at that time, um, they held off on uh, an initial offering information until they could kind of piece together something coherent to pass on. So we put it, because if we were to put out immediately that something terrible had happened, but we had no additional information, there would be an avalanche of, of calls to not only the town of Willington, but the barracks and uh, people asking general questions if we could just, they, they felt that we could hold off a little bit and put something concrete together that would answer a lot of those questions and the word could get out in such a way that people would understand what was going on. I think it's also important to recognize that um, while uh, most of us, certainly on here, utilize uh, both social media and maybe a few more modern technologies, all of our residents don't. And so that reverse 911 gives us the ability to make sure that we reach um, hopefully everybody, if not everybody, um, I'm pretty close there too in our community. And some of the other concerns that have been um, shared is certainly when um, we knew the individual had left Willington and was in the Derby area, a reverse 911 went out immediately. Um, and, and, and why there as immediate and not here. Certainly um, it was a hor horrific incident and, and they feel, uh, you know, we all feel that that should have you know, maybe should have happened immediately. I, I will say to you all, one of the first things I asked Lieutenant Palmer um, and his information, again, he was not on scene, was coming from those he responds to, was do we need um, a shelter in place and do we need to lock everything down here in Willington? So that, you know, your safety um, was at the forefront of the conversations I was having with them. It's the information that comes from there that we rely on. Um, so I think I, I just I want you to know that, that there is absolute concern for your safety um, on our end. I don't believe there wasn't uh, on the end of the troop, but that there were, uh, you know, clearly some missteps that, um, you know, we could do over. But if you could answer to why in Derby it happened so fast, but not here. And uh, unfortunately, being here in North Central Connecticut and being responsible for Troop T, I can't speak to what the decision in the Derby incident was. I don't know if that reverse 911 went out from the town or from the state. Uh, in order for that reverse 911 to happen, uh, in certain areas, towns have access to a system of that nature, and in certain areas, they rely on uh, a county mutual aid like TN up here in town, or it comes through the state police uh, message center. I don't know the decision process based on what occurred in Derby or who put that reverse 911 out. Uh, I, I recognize that it didn't occur here in the investigation in Willington, and that is obviously something that we need to be aware of, that that word did not get out as, as widely as we had to leave at the time, and that is something that we got to make, that we have to account for. I, I can also see the comments that folks are, um, 
I mean, are posting here. I'm trying to read them as they come can in. Can I, I speak I saw... to that? So first, yeah. we're, we're trying to, you know, look at the comments at the same time. We're not, I hadn't really planned on um, mon have someone to monitor those who are looking. I will ask you, um, you all have concerns, but to be respectful and know that there may be um, folks on this call um, who have family members who were involved and please be respectful of your comments and they're there. They're certainly, um, I don't want to turn it off and I don't want to stifle your need to speak and be part of the conversation. But if we could all just be a little bit respectful about what it is that we are sharing. Thank you. Lieutenant Palmer, go ahead. Um, so I, I am looking at some of the comments and one of the ones I saw was, had to do with um, erring on the side of caution and it's a, it's, it's an incredibly difficult decision-making process with what information gets out there. And it, it seems, uh, sometimes it seems very cut and dried, but again, the information that the major crime squad and the detectives from Troop C were developing was at times um, unconfirmed. So the, sending out unconfirmed information could possibly be a significant issue um, in people's safety, not, not just the, the folks in town, but elsewhere, um, you know, we, we were patrolling uh, aggressively throughout the night. We were in the area. The town, was, uh, the town of Wellington was, was never uh, left unattended, for lack of a better word. As a matter of fact, we had extra troopers in the area throughout the entirety of the incident up until we knew for sure he was, uh, he was not here anymore. Uh, one of the things I can share with you is that the path of travel that um, that we determined wasn't solidified until late Saturday night and it, it led us to believe that uh, there were multiple things that could have occurred with regard to whether he was still in the area or not. Again, it doesn't change the fact that the, nine, the reverse 911 did not go out and clearly at this point uh, we know that the social media slash news conference wasn't sufficient to get folks in the town uh, enough information to be collectively uh, uh, happy with, with that level of communication. So that is something Lieutenant Naiello are bringing back to the command staff and a discussion we're having in terms of protocols as we move forward. But as to the Derby piece again, um, now that the FBI is involved and, and there's an investigation down in Derby that's being managed by a different major crime squad, I really don't have any information relative to what decisions were made relative to the response down there and why. Okay. Um, another um, d disturbing theme I saw in um, a handful of um, emails, John and Leslie, I'm sure you saw the same thing, were responses from um, whether it be a dispatcher or someone at, at Troop C when folks called and asked for information and, and trying to gain information. Um, comments about, uh, you know, Willington, you know, we should ask our residency trooper, oh, you don't have one, you don't want to pay for one, that's what you get. Um, comments to that. Um, I, I, I plan to share those specific um, emails that I got with your office, and, and I hope that you can address those. If you could speak to some of that tonight, are the phone calls that are made there recorded? Is that, you know, we'd like to, I'd like to know that when our residents call as our law enforcement at Troop C, that um, someone, someone at Troop C is not responding to our residents in that manner. It's, um, it's a town choice whether or not we have these particular services and it should have absolutely no bearing on the service that we receive. And I think it needs to be addressed. Um, I think we may have lost Lieutenant Palmer. Mike, can you confirm that? Yeah, I don't see him on the list anymore. Okay. Oh, uh, I do see him. today we had some connection issues. It says he's still connected.
apologize. I see him just go off, so maybe he's going to try to reconnect here. Mike, can you unmute Liza? Yep. She can't seem to do it herself. Thank okay. you. Um, Erica and yes. Jeff, uh, while we're waiting, um, I it seemed like he was having some internet connectivity issues because he was pretty jerk, you know, like halting on my end. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if everybody was experiencing that, but um, I also would like us to make sure we ask him about the um, some of the inconsistencies in the timeline. Several folks are posting about that in the Zoom yes. group chat. I know that that was- I um, did um, this morning in a call with um, uh, Lieutenant Palmer and, and um, Sergeant Aiello, I did ask, there was clearly um, my biggest um, glareable error. Uh, glaring error was that the information, uh, the suspect's photo was released to the public on Friday evening. Um, I can tell you all that I um, spoke with Lieutenant Palmer at 817 on Saturday morning to ask if we had more information that we can release other than um, a male in dark color clothing. Um, and his response was that they did not, but they believed something um, was going to be re released later and it was shortly thereafter. So, um, and anything I went back online to look at um, went along with that timeline that I had. So uh, that is a question that I wanna ask him specifically because I asked earlier this morning if they could um, take a look at that. That certainly um, at least from our residents, calls into question some of the other timeline issues, and, and I hope they can clear that up for us. Mike, you may need to be unmuted. Give me one sec. Did you have other issues with the timeline, Liza, specifically? Or John? Oh, no. I think we're okay. covering those. I and I think we're pretty much covering the uh, what happened so far. Again, well, I don't know if we need him to get back in here. Uh, the people don't need to know the name and phone number of the perpetrator half an hour after the uh, incident, but they do need to know that the incident occurred. And I just don't uh, don't understand how this uh, how this didn't happen I didn't I heard about this uh, about four and a half hours after it happened and I heard I heard about it because a neighbor called me and said hey did you hear and I said hear what and then they filled me in with what they knew which was I, I will share with you all that my um, first interaction was that there had been an assault um, and um, again, Lieutenant Palmer was the person I was speaking with. He was not on scene and had to connect with authorities on scene to be able to give us more details that they are able to give um, our office, my office. And when we um, did connect at that point, he let me know that one of the victims was deceased. So it certainly changed the nature of um, the crime at that point. I did not have details um, available in my office until the 1230 press conference as to the suspect. Um, my understanding, I was not monitoring social media, nor is there anyone here in the office that um, was, was sitting and watching just that information. So we did attend the press conference that they had here at the town office building. And um, then Robin, I recorded that while Robin took notes and then we put together a statement that we used with our email blast. Again, um, using the reverse 911 seems um, like the only way to have gone now, and I understand your concerns about that. Um, I did work with law enforcement asking those questions, and we worked with um, their guidance on that, and we would have used them on that system, making sure we only shared information that didn't hinder their investigation. Um, and, you know, if, if, we, if I knew everything I knew today on Friday, um, I would probably have made different decisions. 
and what I can't do is change those decisions, but I didn't, I want you to know that I, this office had information on an incident. I didn't have detailed information um, that I could have then provided to all of you. That was information that would come from the Connecticut State Police. Lieutenant Paul Omar, we see you're back with us. You're muted, so I don't know if you're able to do that on your own. I just lost him on my end. Mine as well. Well, I see him. Well, I still see him in the participants, but I don't want that to be true. Um, so until he comes back, um, John and Liza, I, I think we can, um, when we talk about the details, I think we need to talk about what we can um, start to put in place and what we can do to move forward. I think it's important that we um, make our residents feel safe in their own community again um, and have trust in us and trust in the state police again. And it may take some time to build that, but we need to um, put something in place and, and not you know, let's talk about what that looks like. Do we work on our own system um, to send out alerts? We would still need to work um, with, with police to make sure we put out accurate information. That's, that's really important. Um, but, and it also means that our residents will have to buy into it. And I don't say, I don't mean buy into financially. Uh, it would be, um, you would have to sign up for any system that we had. It wouldn't be an automatic statewide system that has access to phone numbers. One of the concerns I shared this morning uh, with Lieutenant Palmer is that um, he said to us, and our emergency management director, Stuart, is, was on that call, um, that the reverse 911 only goes to landline. Um, is that correct? So he can uh, see and hear you, but he's off. He can see and hear us, <laughs> um, but he's offline. Um, so he just answered um, me. But Stuart, is that correct? I, I know. Can you want to hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Mike, can you um, unmute Stuart? Please? I don't. Uh, the start video has been disabled from my uh, from your end as okay. well. So the host has disabled it. Yeah, that may. I move my location and... here to see if I. Can... Yep. There we go. Uh, okay. While we. Uh, Go ahead, Stuart. What? So, so cell phones can be added to the system. Typically, there's an online portal, um, and depending on which system you use, similar to the CT Alert uh, system, which is the statewide Everbridge. Uh, Everbridge is the name of the company that provides that service, and there are some competing services, uh, but people could sign up with their cell phone, and they indicate what town they're from, which would uh, have them receive messages if, if they're originating uh, for and about Wellington um, for that. So, okay. but it is dependent for the most part of people signing up with their cell phones. Okay. And it, it's important that we have a system that utilizes both landlines and cell phones. We no longer live in a day where only one method is used. Um, and we need to make sure that um, every member of our community has access to it. So Lieutenant Palmer, one of the things um, we mentioned while uh, you were reconnecting was the discrepancy in the timeline. And I know we spoke about that this morning. Um, for me specifically, the time in which the suspect's um, photo and information was released to the public. And as you can uh, imagine, uh, um, if that was in fact an error, our residents have some questions about the timeline as a whole and whether or not there are other issues. Can you talk to that? Yes, I spoke directly to Lieutenant Ayala in the aftermath of, the, of our meeting this morning in, in PIO as well, and that is not an accurate statement. No information with regard to photos and subject description went out until Saturday morning. So PIO is, is working now to amend that timeline so that it accurate, accurately reflects what happened. I was in early, early Saturday morning and had a discussion with Major Crime Squad about the information that they were satisfied with putting out came from them on Saturday morning PIO. So that Friday night at 25 p.m. is inaccurate. Uh, before I go any further, I want to circle back to what you just said previously before I had, we had the connection issues. And I think it's my end. 
uh, because sometimes the service here can be a little spotty at the barracks. Yeah. Uh, that was the first I heard of, of uh, any citizen contacted barracks with information being given anything less than the utmost with regard to respect and uh, responsiveness. And yes, all the all the calls here are taped when they come into the barracks, um, especially if they're 911 calls. So we'll be reviewing the tapes. And if you have specific times and dates, it would be very valuable for me to have that information. Uh, we spoke on this this morning uh, in our call, um, whether or not a particular town in any area has a resident trooper is irrelevant to us. Lieutenant Aiello said something and I want you all to understand uh, and I'll communicate what he said uh, to the group here. Um, we take this personally uh, that someone uh, dared to, to commit an act such as this in uh, an area we're responsible for. And please remember, troopers live out here. Uh, we have troopers that live in the town of Willington. Uh, troopers live throughout the area. Uh, we are keenly aware of the need to respond appropriately. I passed on some information uh, this morning. The first troopers were on scene within six to seven minutes of the initial call. So we were there very quickly. But if anybody has called this barracks and did not get uh, what they believe to be an appropriate response, I would like the, the date and time that that occurred so that I can look into that and, and take the appropriate action. But the timeline was not accurate as it was given out. And, and that has to do with some of the confusion of multiple uh, multiple entities contributing information to a single uh, single document. So that's being amended by PIO. Liza, did you have other concerns about it or was that the, that that's the, the largest that came to me um, and that I noticed? C can you, um, I know this is going to be a difficult question for you to answer. Liza, can you unmute yourself or no? <laughs> Mike, can you unmute Liza? Um, there, there's certainly concern um, that this individual whose name um, I won't use here, I, I think it's important that we stand behind our, 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 our residents that were affected and, and I won't use his name. Um, it, is there any reason um, that you are aware of to believe he might return to Willington? Um, I think our residents are concerned about that and there's some fear there. Yes, and you know, I spoke this concept a couple of times over the course of from Friday until now. I will tell you that the, there, there doesn't appear to be any reason for him to return to Wellington. Uh, however, he has deep ties to the, the state of Connecticut, especially down in the Southbury, uh, Newtown, um, Burry area. So uh, just to, to try to paint a, a picture of the efforts, you know, the FBI and other state and, and local law enforcement agencies were involved in the investigation from very early on. And now you could, see, uh, since he crossed state lines, the FBI has been able to take a much more robust uh, assistance uh, position within the investigation. So there, there have been, when I say a multitude of search warrants and other documentation submitted to the courts for approval for various pieces of information and locations, uh, we're doing everything we can to try to identify whether or not he would ever return to the state of Connecticut, let alone to the town of Wellington. However, I would be remiss if I were to say he's not coming back here. I can't say for any to any degree of certainty of 100% that, that he may not come back here. However, I will tell you that it, it's, it's extremely difficult for him to move about freely and the Troop C uh, barracks will be positioning itself in such a way as to be uh, immediately responsive and, and on the lookout for any possible return. We don't think it's likely, but you know, we are, we're operating in such a way that we're ready for any eventuality. Okay, thank you. Um, some, some of the other questions, and again, these may be um, partial to your investigation and, and you may or may not share. Um, folks want to know why roadblocks in the area that you believed um, he may have been and you were concentrating your search weren't set up or used. Um, roadblocks. So are people talking about um, a checkpoint where we search everybody who passes through an area? I mean, um, I know it cordoned off like the investigative area, but are folks talking and I'm just looking for a little, are they sure, talking so about an area in which every vehicle? 
every vehicle that passed by gets checked. Yes, that was, those were some of the questions and specifically in the uh, Turnpike Road, Moose Meadow area, the area um, in, in where the, uh, his motorcycle was found. And that seems to be the area he um, left Willington from. So the understanding is why would, uh, why would you folks not have locked down that particular area if that was the case? And, and the highway on ramps, I think, especially, um, not just in Willington, but in the general area. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, one of the issues that we struggled with uh, was the amount of personnel we had available and we brought in additional people and the most effective way we can manage that, uh, the manpower issues that we experience is by moving people around um, you know, the number of exits that we could have potentially had to cover both east and westbound. Uh, we were active up at the travel center off of exit 71. Uh, we positioned people, and, and part of the issue we had is every time we got folks in an area, there would be a call that brought us somewhere else to investigate a potential tip or lead that required us to move people around. So um, given the, the number of folks we were, bring, we were bringing into the area, we we're trying to cover an enormous geographic area in such a way that a static checkpoint in the immediacy of, the, of that uh, incident wasn't practical for us. We just didn't have enough people to put them in all the places, even in the area where the motorcycle was found uh, uh, in order to, to run some kind of checkpoint because those areas, um, there's not a heavy vehicle traffic footprint in that, in that um, where the motorcycle was found. So the ability to position now there was someone there with that motorcycle for the duration of time it was out there until it was transported to the barracks uh, as evidence but we didn't have the, the the raw number of people to park someone in every off and on ramp uh in the, in the wider area and the geography was something that we battled throughout the night okay john any comments, questions? Make sure you're. Um, well, com comments simply what we're going back to uh, is the delay in notifying the, uh, uh, notifying the residents that there, that there was danger. I mean, we said something here about, we didn't know if he had left town or if he was still in town or if he had left town. I would think that we would assume that he was here until we knew for certain that he had left town because that would be airing again on the side of caution. Uh, yes, sir. Remember, we were, we were operating on multiple potential outcomes there. We didn't, we didn't assume he left town. Operating on the fact that he could have left town and it was just as likely he was still in town. We brought the resources we could bring to bear as quickly as possible to that. Uh, again, the, the, the reverse 911 or even the, uh, the Everbridge or, or ct.gov alert system, you know, it, it, clearly the word did not get out as widely as we believed it had. So that is something that we are cognizant of. And, and uh, this morning when we had that discussion, that is something we'll be passing up the chain of command to make sure that uh, uh, everyone recognizes that despite the fact we believed we had, we had satisfied that need by virtue of what we did, we did not. So that is something that we, we are aware of and that is something that uh, we're taking away. Uh, and again, it's gonna be a collaborative effort between the towns and us in such a way that uh, if you stand up your own system, we will make ourselves available to vet information and get it out there, no matter what the nature of the crisis, be it weather related or otherwise. Uh, and at the same time, uh, in, in the midst of an emergency, know what the path to travel for that information will be beyond PIO uh, and, and those social media outlets. The, 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 the days of just the news being sufficient or the, or the idea that the, um, the social media piece was enough clearly was not the case. So uh, okay. obviously you're having a, some kind of an internal investigation, maybe not a formal one, but you're looking into what happened here. Once you've reached a uh, conclusion on it, are you going to issue it out so the people of Wellington can see it? I mean, it won't be tomorrow or the next day, I understand. It might take a period of time, but I'm sure 
in order to reestablish trust that a lot of people seem to have lost, uh, I think that would be a very big help once it's completed. After the review, there's something for a uh, multitude of incidents and reasons. And one will be undertaken for this. Which that happen, and I can't uh, hear immediately, but we're already complete. All right. I'm going to, uh, I apologize. It looks like we lost him again and see if maybe uh, he can call. So I've asked him to call in instead of video and see if that helps with a connection. <laughs> Um, while while I, we wait for him to come back on, I, I'd like to um, acknowledge um, our residents who have uh, come together like we always do. Um, we, we are an incredibly tight um, community who, uh, you know, always um, is there when someone needs them. And right now, um, these families need us um, and we need each other. And so to the volunteers who put together the vigil, um, on the green um, in this social distance time. It's very difficult not to be together, but I want to acknowledge that if you had an opportunity to leave a candle on the green, it'll be tonight until 9.30 and tomorrow again from 7 p.m. to 9.30. Um, so, you know, I just, I want to acknowledge the way our community has, um, you know, wrapped these families um, as, as much as we can. We have to understand that some have asked to remain anonymous and we need to respect um, their wishes. At the same time, we want to help them. We want to, you know, people want to start a GoFundMe. We want to do all that we can. Um, but until they want our help, we kind of sit on the sidelines and, and do what we can. So keep them in your thoughts. Pray for them. Um, I apologize. I, uh, Robin, can you access your email quickly? Or no? If you could email him the Zoom information. Um, so, so I want to thank I, I want to thank all of you who have um, stepped up to to make sure. Um, oh, no, Robin, if you have the phone number, if you could just if you could give it to me, and not in an email. Mike, can you unmute Robin? Sorry, am I who to Lieutenant Palmer? Yeah, but I'm going to text it to him. His uh, uh, he doesn't have email capability currently. So oh, okay, hang on. Phone number to call. Okay, you want me to text it to you then? Yeah. Oh, I see okay. someone put it in the in the um, chat here, so I'm going to send that. Thank you for whoever. Okay, just one <laughs> eight seven six nine nine two J. Thank you, folks. Okay. Um, so, so again, thank you. Um, continue to can continue to keep them in your thoughts. Um, check in on your neighbors. Look after each other. That's uh, it's important, and it's not um, just today or tomorrow or next week, but I, I think for a while. Um, and, I, and I am I'm trying to read every comment as it comes through as we participate in this. Um, and I see someone, I'm not going to, uh, I won't call you by name if you want to remain anonymous, but there's um, some concern about whether or not all of the activity on Myrtle Road took away from resources in other areas. And I think he'll speak to that as that was a crime scene at that point. Um, law enforcement will know better um, than we will as to whether or not that many resources were needed there as well. So I will, um, I see that question come up a couple of times. I will ask that.
that I will ask about whether or not they will have um, a presence back in the Myrtle uh, Road area. Um, so while we wait, Erica. Yes. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, one of the things, so you had started to ask last time he got disconnected um, about what something might look like in the future. Um, I want to also consider that, you know, w Willington's a small town um, and we're surrounded by other small towns who may or may be divided by a, you know, a line on a map, but are very close to us, yes. um, who also, um, I think a couple of the, I, I received a couple personal emails, and then um, I think a couple of our comments were from folks from like Ashford and Mansfield and stores who are really nearby, who also um, wanted um, wanted to know why there wasn't more communication to, to nearby towns as well. So I think as we're thinking of whatever system we're gonna put in place, we should be thinking, um, regionally, um, since we are so close together okay. here. So I will share with you the call that um, he and I referenced this morning um, was with uh, Pat Wilson Phineas, our, our state rep, um, one of the selectmen from Ashford, um, our EMD and myself, along with representatives from uh, Troop C, kind of talking about communications and um, what we could look at going forward and what they would look like um, specifically with Ashford because will Ashford, unlike stores and Talland who have a resident state trooper and other um, things already in place, Willington and Ashford do not. And so we were talking about how we could better communicate and, and have give access to information to our residents. So we started that conversation, but I think there's a bigger you know, a much bigger, broader conversation to have. And I think it's much bigger um, than just myself in this office or even the three of us that we, you know, need to make sure we bring people into so that we can have a plan. Um, I hope this never, never happens again. And we formulate a plan that doesn't need to be used for this type of event, but I want us to be prepared. And what this show, has shown us is that some of the um, choices we've made from the town side um, aren't, aren't necessarily working and there's, there's holes there and, and we can work to fix that. So whatever plan is, but it's important to know that if we use a plan um, like an Everbridge or um, Mansfield uses, I believe it's called Code Red, those are things residents will have to sign up for. So we're gonna have to work really hard to make sure that everyone signs up for them, especially some of our um, elderly residents who wouldn't necessarily get an email from us or see a social media post and finding a way utilizing all of our resources, the senior center, the library. All right, he's back on mic. So if you see that phone number. Um, and using all those resources to make sure we get that information from every resident possible. Uh, you know, do we put something in a text? But there's a, there's a much broader conversation to have here. Um, and I'd like us to move in a direction of setting that up. Once again, we are still in COVID time, so it makes it harder um, to, to meet and meeting face-to-face -face, um, while it's good is, is not a method we have at our disposal, but it doesn't mean we have to wait. So we'll meet, you know, let's try to put something together and bring in some outside resources to share information with us, um, our first responders in on that conversation um, and, and put together a committee. You, if you saw in your emails, there were even some suggestions from residents to do that. I, I think that's the direction we need to go in um, and start working towards positive um, changes. All right, let's see if he used a different number. One moment. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. All right, I, I, I abandoned the Zoom piece because it just wasn't uh, staying up here at the barracks. And again, I think that's very much on my end with the uh, connectivity. I'd like to circle back and finish up. Yes, there will be an after action review. Uh, I know you've, I've been listening to some of your conversations since I got back online, but yes, there will be an after action review. 
Uh, we very much appreciate the recognition. It's not going to happen right away. Uh, but when that is developed, that goes up the chain of command, and then um, we can have discussions on releasing uh, uh, to what extent we can release that information. I think it would be most important for us to provide you, um, you know, the, the, the fact that we followed up with the towns in the manner in which we are right now, having these discussions with the residents and the key people within the towns, but what the plan will be as time goes forward. Uh, so, yes, there will be an after action. Um, um, I'm monitoring or trying to look at the comments here and see um, for those folks who live on Myrtle Road, um, there's some concern that because of familiarity with uh, residents on that road, that um, there may be reason for him to go back to that area. I know you've said to us um, it would be difficult for him, but I, I know we can't say with certainty that it would be impossible. Is there any um, is there anything in place for um, more patrols or checks in on that area or planned? Has that been discussed? Yes, that's ongoing. Uh, that ties back to, to what I explained, how we, we've, been, uh, we've been out there continuously with more personnel than we generally have on the shift, and we will continue to do that. You know, I, I would just ask, like we discussed previously, the geography in the town is sometimes a challenge. Um, so. Um, if, if, there, if you believe there's a need to have someone posted there, we can have those discussions. Um, but right now, uh, the guidance out of the barracks to the, each shift is there will be ongoing and aggressive patrols throughout the area of Wellington uh, so that people can see us out there and we are available to respond, uh, knowing that you know, any set of circumstances can pull people away for a brief period of time. Uh, we are adjusting patrols. So, for example, if the trooper assigned to the Mansfield area is available, but the trooper who has the Wellington responsibility has to go somewhere, the Mansfield trooper is coming up towards Wellington to be in that area as well. So, if you think that there would be, um, if you think that uh, there would be some uh, some request for an even more robust. Uh, uh, presence, and you know, I would ask that you and I discuss it so that we can have an idea of exactly what folks' expectations are and then what we can provide. I am willing to go to uh, the commanders within the organization and say this is what we need for right now, and I, uh, I don't anticipate any issues. Uh, and, and, and I appreciate the fact that you're, you're asking for that, so that helps me try to guide you know, the, the collective response out of the barracks. Uh, we can adjust accordingly. Okay. Um, another comment here is, um, if there's information that he's heading back in this direction, would the reverse 911 uh, be used now? Yes. If there's, if there's a reason to believe this individual will be back in the area, that notification will be a, a, along so many different platforms that it would be unlikely anyone would be unawares. Um, uh, the, if it would be a very small percentage of people that would not be aware if that had to go out again. So yes, like okay. I said, we, we understand people uh, did not get the word to the extent that we believe they did. We're, we're very clear on that. And so we will make sure that if the need were to arise, that information would go out. Okay. Um, and, and another common theme, again, in our emails, um, Liza and John, feel free to jump in here, was um, that the term isolated event was used by the PIO. Um, from, from CSP and um, can you help us understand why um, that may not have been corrected or changed um, as well as some of the inaccurate information on roads in Willington. Um, you referred to Route 20 instead of Route 320. Um, those are some, some mistakes that uh, you know, people are concerned with. Okay, so the, the isolated incident piece came from very early on. There was no, we couldn't identify a reason for anyone to be in that particular area, uh, given its location. Uh, so no one there seemed to have any idea who, who possibly owned that motorcycle. Uh, and they're at the, in the initial stage of the investigation, up to and including at the time of the press conference, we couldn't identify why someone would be up there. And that's why that initial information went out in such a way as to make it uh, the statement, an isolated incident, had to do with the fact that there was nothing we could determine to bring someone there. Therefore, at that moment in time, uh, 
we couldn't explain why it happened. So um, afterward, and you know, the roads and 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 speaking to the roads, um, sometimes those the information gets forwarded, and you know, unfortunately, we don't ca we don't catch a typo when someone puts something out that sh that that's not reflective of um, of the. Um, uh, of the the street, it's uh, I asked how to spell Myrtle about half a dozen times to make absolutely sure PIO got that correct because it is such an unusual spelling uh, uh, in the town. So yes, 320 versus Route 20, those are things. Unfortunately, every, you know on a, that information should have reflected accurately the route in and of itself, or at least the the street name that co-joins that route. So yes, uh, we recognize some of those things occurred. Uh, so we're, we're endeavoring to fix them just like they, they're trying to fix the timeline uh, issue. And again, a lot of that has to do with the sheer volume of information we were trying to uh, vet and determine what would be released and then get it out there in such a way uh, as to be valuable to people. So yes, there, there were certain instances in which uh, the root names were not accurate. And that isolated incident statement came from the early investigation. Okay. Um, can you, I apologize, I'm trying to go back to the comment. Um, can you, and I don't believe it was in the timeline, um, talk to us about what time the motorcycle was found? Um, I, I cannot, unfortunately. Okay. My responsibilities weren't um, relative to the investigation. I know it was found. Uh, I know it was when I was at the scene the first time. I definitely cannot speak to the exact time it was located. I know the motorcycle was located first. Uh, another piece of evidence was located a little bit later, and then um, the, um, another piece of evidence wasn't located until uh, after 7.30 at night on Saturday. And that was through the use of a significant number of search and rescue dogs combing the area for evidence and for any sign of anyone in the area. Okay. And just, uh, you know, I, I know some of your questions are specific to details um, of the investigation and, um, you know, I can share all of these, but I don't know um, how many of them will truly be answered. I think Lieutenant Palmer gave us information that, that unfortunately he was only allowed to share, um, which is frustrating to us because we, we want to know details and, and we want to know some of the specifics. Um, and, and while I may not like it, you may not like it, we understand they're still trying to build a case against an individual um, that upon capture could um, stand trial for his horrific um, actions and, and bring some sort of justice. So, um, it's frustrating. Can I speak a little bit to that Absol information? Absolutely. I don't know if you can okay, still so see the chat, but probably not now. I can't. Yeah, yeah that, that yeah. just kept uh, shutting down on me. So regards to specific information, I, I know there's a desire for people to understand why this happened. And um, what, what happens sometimes in investigators, uh, or I would say new investigators are often, uh, they get trapped in creating a version of events to kind of explain why certain things happen when there's nothing to back up that conclusion. So unfortunately, we're beholden to trying to find out what happened and then confirm the details with regard to the evidence we're coll collecting. So if someone were to make a statement and were to get printed by the press that this occurred or this was the reason why, um, that may ultimately be what we determined after a lengthy investigation. But in that moment, we can't possibly say, yes, that's the case, because we just don't know. Um, you know, the hope is that we capture this individual and he explains to us chapter and verse about what happened and why, but sharing any information at this point in time without any conf ability to confirm the accuracy of it would be a disservice to everyone, including, uh, including the families. And that's just something we can't do. Liza, um, <laughs> well, I mean, and I think, so I want to, I don't know, there's a couple of like big 
um, issues that are sort of, of hanging hanging over us. And and I think one of the things that you mentioned, Lieutenant, was about you know the wanting to know why. And I think we are very much all as a community in that place. Um, and we do have to understand. And I know that I have a lot of questions that can't be answered um, at this point in time, whether it's for um, you know to protect the the case or whether it's because that information just isn't known. And um, I think we as, as humans don't like to be in that place of unknowing and uncertainty. Um, and I know we have to live in there, live, live in that place for a little while um, because uh, this is evolving. Um, and I, you know, I wanna, I wanna say that there was um, a lot of activity online that was both a blessing and a curse, I think for all of us. Um, the blessing was that for, for most of us, like we wouldn't have known, you know, if to keep our kids inside, um, you know, if there wasn't such a strong network of communication um, online and via text. I got a couple of text messages, um, you know, ap in, after lunch hour. Uh, so I think that speaks to how connected we are. And, and, and that is really, that shows the Willington strong and, and, and that's wonderful. Um, and I'm, you know, heartened by that. Um, I think we also, at the same time, there are moments that online we have um, shared pieces of information that have been conjecture um, on our part so that we've heard through somebody who's heard through somebody. And um, I think it's been, it's very hard for us to sort of separate the information that is fact versus the information that comes through um, uh, other sources that, you know, the game of telephone that happens. So um, I, I know there are things that we feel we know um, because we've heard it and it's been reaffirmed through various sources. But, you know, I also know that we have to live in this uncertainty right now because we don't actually know all the things we believe that we know based on what's been shared, um, even in the Willington Strong Group and in the, um, uh, the Willington Crime Watch page. Uh, on Facebook that it's just there's there's a lot and I know that there's a lot of people that have said that they've had to disconnect from those sources because there's just so much conjecture flying around and I just want us all to be careful of that um, because that is not helping ourselves in this time of stress um, and anxiety and, and I know that site yeah, was set up to help to help each other and to keep each other uh, aware of things um, so I don't want to see it go away, um, but just be mindful no. of what is shared there. So thank you, Liza. That's yeah. And, and again, my point is just mm -hmm. to remember that sometimes we don't know the things that we feel like we know, right? And and I tend to be very verbose. So, but that's the that's my ultimate <laughs> point. Um, uh, now I appreciate that. And here's what I want to add to that. Um, we live in an age where while we're conducting this investigation we know a tremendous amount of information is flowing through the, the networks, not just in the town of Willington, but elsewhere. Um, and part of what we're doing is seeing whether or not any of that has value, but the other part is tamping down to the best of our ability things that um, are inaccurate. So for example, um, over the course of the time frame that the investigation was immediately ongoing up into including early the, the early morning hours of Saturday, um, every time the troop reported an arrested party, there was some degree of, oh, they got them. And we had multiple conversations where I explained that, nope, that's another person arrested in a separate incident or a different incident. So yes, I very much appreciate that aspect of, you know, folks hear things, they want to get it out there, and we try to tamp down what we can. But part of what we do as investigators is, we have to act somewhat transparently. That's why the degree to what assets were out there, when they were out there, and where they were out there was kind of kept close to the vest because if social media, we, we struggled mightily on that first day with um, the press and, and, and the social media piece following us around in our investigative efforts. And the concern we had was if someone were watching social media or if the individual was getting communication from outside sources, then any number of people could be feeding him our investigative efforts and, and someone could be slipping through whatever net we were trying to throw over the area. So some of what we did was extremely transparent and there was a, the reason behind that was 
an effort to not divulge any of the investigative efforts we were making in an attempt to make sure that he, people were unaware of what we were doing so he did not, the person did not get the benefit of forewarned. Um, our, um, I've had a couple of comments in here. Um, our, some of our residents, and I'm sure many um, at the same time, want to know how um, both our first responders uh, and your officers who arrived on the scene um, are doing, that we can't imagine um, some of the things they have to deal with. And so folks want to um, make sure that they're um, doing okay as well. So. Uh, oh, that's very, on. very much appreciated. I, uh, I am a, uh, a peer volunteer within the state police. So part of my responsibility includes kind of talking to folks in those moments of need. And uh, I've had a couple conversations with some of the, the troopers that responded uh, to that incident. And one of the things that will happen uh, is a, a critical uh, incident stress management debrief that our, our uh, peer support program will be putting on, and that will include um, the first responders from the town. So okay, when we get to that point, uh, uh, we'll, we'll select a site in the troop area. Some folks who are highly trained in that SISM piece will come out. Uh, I will have a very different role because I'm involved in the circumstances in this instance, but uh, that would be open to uh, other law enforcement members or first responders that were out there that day, uh, they will come and they will be able to uh, to talk through uh, that incident. So yes, uh, thank you very much for that uh, for that question and know that there's already something in the works to help address that and the folks in Willington will be invited. You may have your own um, support network in town there, but in these instances, maybe you know, getting together as a, a complete group will have some value as well. Okay. Uh, if I um, may, Alec, oh, go ahead, John. Um, I, uh, I wonder if we're getting off the subject here. Uh, we had a, uh, we put out a email request for anybody who wanted to comment on tonight's meeting. Yes. Send an email, a email in, and uh, I read every one of them. By my count, there were 56 responses. And two of those responses uh, weren't really relevant to the issue, and two of them were people who said, "Hey, I think I think the town and the CSP handled this very well," and the other 52 were really, really angry. And the thing they were angry about was not that they can't look in the paper tonight and see what uh, the where the uh, investigation stands. They were angry because their kids were out on the lawn and there's this guy going through town with, uh, without a machete or with a machete and they're not being told. And, and they don't need to know. All they, all they want to know is they should get their kids inside and lock the doors. And this is where the failure came in. And for tonight, I think this is what, um, what we need to know. We've heard... Uh, plenty from Lieutenant Palmer. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I think he's telling us that that this was a, an oops, and we need to find out why. And for the town, the same thing. I know uh, one of, or a couple of the people here said, "Well, we need a task force to to study this and make recommendations." Uh, okay, I suppose that's a good idea, but we re do we really know? what the recommendations are gonna be in the end. And I think they would be that we need to get something like reverse 911, Everbridge, whoever put in place. And, uh, and then it would be up to the town government to decide when and where to use that. Remember, this is not, a, this is not an everyday occurrence. No, it's not. It's a one in a million thing, so. Um, and I think that's where we're going to end. I, but I don't, if... Don, I don't think it hurt, help, hurts to broaden the conversation um, and to have a bigger picture uh, conversation and, and not just what software can we buy to put information out there, but come up with our own protocols in place um, so that this doesn't 
um, happen again, no matter what the situation is. It may not have been it be this horrific situation, but it may be something else. So we we can always do better. And I think we've learned from this. We have some we have some room to improve here. Um, and if 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 we don't feel that the information from police, who we rely on for that guidance, and I will tell you that I did rely on that guidance, and we want to push the button ourselves that we know what to say and we have the ability to do that immediately. And, and what, what is that? What does that look like? Look, I've had a lot of calls and questions, and even in this chat, do we need a resident state trooper? I think it begs the question to let's talk about that and what that would do for us and have a more broad conversation. Um, I think you, you know, may have seen the comment from from uh, one, you know, what we could look at and what we could study and make realistic recommendations. And that doesn't happen in a one meeting like this. It takes, it takes a lot of work um, and more people at the table and more conversation. And the suggestion was, um, you know, a task force or committee with representation from law enforcement, EMS, Board of Selectmen, Board of Ed, Board of Finance and residents that would be able to, and this is just one suggestion, to determine what can be done to make Willington safer, make realistic recommendations, advocate for whatever funding will be necessary, and put solutions in place. I think that's important. Um, and, you know, we could say, let's buy a program to use it, but if we don't put any protocols in place in order to do that, or take this opportunity and dissect it and, and know what, what we want to do and how we want to do it, I think we're doing another disservice. I think we're overdoing it. That's my opinion. I'm not sure that um, I feel that I can overdo making our community that is hurting and feels unsafe. If you're reading these comments and seeing and getting the phone calls and getting people don't feel safe in their own home and with with good reason. A horrific event happened. Um, a man, uh, you know, holed up in our community over the course of 48 hours. And, and our community is frightened and, and angry and hurt. And we need, to, we need to do better by them. And I'm not sure that looking at something is overdoing it at all. And I wanna, um, a couple of uh, comments have been made here um, in, the, in the chats and, um, and also in the emails that I think what um, the communication, the initial communication was lacking, but then also ongoing communication. Um, and I think this is both the responsibility of the, the, CA, the CSP and the town of Willington. We need to also do a better job of, of communicating. And we've had these conversations before yeah. that communicating broadly to the town is very challenging. We have tried various methods. We've, you know, we've had our newsletters, um, we have email, um, and it wasn't all that long ago. It was maybe it was right before we, um, you know, we were no longer to meet in person that we that we had a, a conversation in a in a regular board of selectmen meeting about ways to improve communication um, to the town, and we have it every year around the elections um, or referendums. We have you know this conversation about how, how challenging it is to be in communication with the town, and so I think again revisiting that conversation of we we need better communication, not just in this very specific emergency situation, but in general, so that the community knows what we're doing um, in general. And that's a two-way street, right? Like, as we've said, the email, it's an opt-in email. If you wanna get the town emails, you have to voluntarily sign up for that. If you wanna get um, an Everbridge, or I'm not sure what the name of the company is, you have to opt in and sign up for that. But we also have to offer those things that are accessible and available um, to the town. So. So it is a two-way street, and I think that's a conversation that we really, we do need to have continually. Right, and I'll, I'll never, um, uh, John, we can agree on a lot of things, but I, I can never agree that we can go um, overboard in public safety. I don't think taking safety, it, it's, look, we live here too. It's our families. We all have families here um, that we're concerned about as much as our residents, and, and we can never, never um, go too far in having the conversation and, and looking at reasonable solutions as opposed to the three of us having a meeting, deciding what we think is gonna work and, and just purchase something and, and hope that it works. I think we need a solid plan. I think um, it's like insurance policy. If we never need to use it for a horrific event like this, I guess I'd rather be prepared. 
Um, but I'd rather, I'd like to, you know, have people come to the table to talk about that. Look at the number of people that are uh, in this room, in this Zoom room. Um, they care and, and they want to know and they want to know what we're going to do. They don't want to know just what happened, but they want to know what we're going to do for them moving forward. And we owe that to them. And so um, if that means another committee and another conversation, I say that that's what we do and, and, and let's move forward and, and put some, some people with knowledge at the table with us um, and help us make these decisions. Can I add something to that portion of the conversation? Yes, you may. Um, recognizing that the word did not get out in the manner in which we hoped, um, we want to partner with the town uh, and all the towns in the troop area, but in particular Willington in this instance, to be a resource in those conversations regarding what you think is best for the town relative to whether it's a resident trooper or whatever system you put into place and collaborate much better in terms of getting the information out there. Uh, in the immediacy of the moment, decisions were made and we believed that, that, uh, that we had gotten the word out there in such a manner that um, we, had, we had disseminated that info. And clearly, we did not get it out there far enough or wide enough. So we need to we need to be part of your solution in fixing that. And please consider us a resource in those conversations, uh, whether it's uh, assistance with concepts behind the communication, the, the platforms, you know, the resident trooper conversation. I'm willing to have at any point in time. Uh, but please consider us part of that process by which you're going through in the town to try to remedy that communication piece. Right. Um, and so in some of these questions, I, I may say a resident state trooper, I'm not advocating for any resource and I think that takes conversation and I don't think there's a one size fits all or um, that a resident state trooper could fix every problem we have with, um, you know, law enforcement issues. It's just an avenue that would be explored. So um, I, I don't believe that having a resident state trooper um, would have changed in this situation. Um, but it, you know, it it offers some benefits that other things don't. And so having a conversation about what all those look, looks like is what's gonna be important going forward and absolutely having law enforcement at the table with us, I think is important. So um, that's what I'd like um, to see us put together moving forward. I, I think it's gonna be important and important to start, to start that process soon um, and not wait. So, you know, what comes of it is ultimately going to be um, part of um, a town resource and that the town will have to support. It will, whatever we do, will come with funding that's necessary and, and we'll have to be advocating for that. And so the town will ultimately get a say in that. This is, you know, we are in a public forum. They, they get to participate in this process. And I think it's important that they hear from us. So if we don't start the conversation, we don't hear from, from those we're supposed to be um, serving and protecting. If I may. Yes, John. Uh, I, understand that what we're talking about here is something that's a, uh, a one-off of one in a million occurrence that happened. Uh, the complaint here is that there was no way to uh, communicate to the other people. Now, yes, I understand we can get it, we can form a committee and this committee can meet and meet and study and maybe even hire a consultant and after a year, year and a half, they can come in and say, we need to get Everbridge. And um, okay, because remember, this is not as Liza said, uh, well, we've already had this conversation trying to get people to vote and how we don't communicate with the people in town. This is not trying to communicate with the people in town on whether we should, should, they should get out and vote or to tell them that we're having a uh, Willington Day or tell them that hey, Merry Christmas. This is going to be the one very uh, rare situation when we need something as we did last Friday. And that's all we would be doing. The rest of it, do we need a resident state trooper? We've had that argument before. I'm sure we'll have it again. I don't think a resident state trooper would have helped in this particular case. Uh, I don't think it would have changed a thing. And we can discuss that again, but I don't think it's part of the solution to our problem here. 
the solution to our problem here is to be able to talk to people when they, when there is an imminent danger, and that's the only one. Well, I think I think a system that we put in place could be utilized for a different number of resources, John. And um, you know, the the one in a million situation that you speak of happened. It's happening. Um, and we have a family and our multiple families in our community who are dealing with that. And, and I don't suppose um, they'd appreciate, appreciate us waiting for the next one in a million situation before we took action. So. Um, That's not what I said. I said we should take action now because as far as I can see, the only action we need is to get a reverse 911 situation in. And you're saying, well, no, we've got to get a meetings and we have to find out and uh... I think there are two, two issues, John. I don't think they're the same question. I think, yes, we all, all three of us agree that we need to pin down very quickly a 911, the reverse 911 or whatever system. I think all three of us have agreed that we need to pin that down in this conversation. I think the broader context is what we're alluding to, that there is the emergency situation, there is also ongoing communications. And this is not just in this one-time situation, it expands to other situations. Just like with the state trooper, it's not just in this situation where um, having the conversation again about the resident state trooper would be beneficial. And, and I actually disagree. I think that if we had a resident state trooper, things might have been a little bit different. There might have been somebody who was our Willington advocate who knew the community better and, you know, was able to, you know, and, and knew Erica better. And I, I don't know. Um, so I do think that there is the potential that having a resident state trooper would have. But that's not the only question that I'm trying to get to. I know that this, this conversation tonight is very specific to what happened on Friday. I want to look at it also in the broader context of what Willington is and who Willington is. We also have ongoing conversations about um, noise and nuisance and complaints and speeding. And all of this is connected. All of this is connected. The fact that Willington is under-resourced in this area yeah. is all connected. Granted, the chances of something like this happening again are very slim, but there are all these other issues that are that are on top that happen on a regular basis. And if this is an impetus for us to relook at those situations for the resident state trooper conversation, I think it's a valid conversation to engage in. And I also believe that looking at our ability to communicate outwards to the community at large is a valid conversation to have regardless of whether um, we're talking about an emergency situation or we're talking about other critical issues of getting information out to the community. So yes to the 911 thing happening ASAP. Also yes to the broader conversations of how are we making sure our town is and feels safer and how are we communicating better to our residents. So yeah, I think there are lots of lessons to be learned here um, and, and we, we just we need to we need to move in a positive direction. So um, I think, John, you know, in some facet, we want uh, the same things, but, um, you know, how we go about getting all, all of that is, is where we may not see eye to eye, but, but I think together we can do what's right um, and, and what folks put us in these positions to do, and we will do right by them. Um, I'm trying, I appreciate that um, we asked for your comment, your comments in writing. Um, and again, I think you've heard us all say we, we read every one of them and didn't anticipate the chat portion of this, but it's important. Um, I'm trying to get to as many of them um, as I can. There were some questions um, here. I apologize as I go um, back through. Um, someone asked if these comments will be captured and segregated into general categories that can be addressed as we move forward. Um, and um, I don't know, I'm going to ask our moderator, um, Mike, it, can the chat be captured for us? Is that possible? Yeah, I can save the chat. Okay, great. Um, so we'll save that. It won't um, be part of the uh, public record, but it will be saved. Someone else asked in here if this uh, meeting would be made public. Yes. 
All of our uh, meetings are recorded on either Zoom or GoToMeeting and they are shared on the town's um, YouTube page. And so this, um, when it's um, available tomorrow or Friday, will go up on that YouTube page. We'll share that on our website. Um, and so, yes, um, someone who didn't see this can see this. I want to acknowledge, uh, take a minute, I, I talked about Willington and, and our residents and how strong we are despite um, the adversity we're experiencing. Um, I believe it started as a private GoFundMe um, from some friends of uh, Mr. Demers and the Demers family, and then they allowed it to go public. Um, people have been incredibly generous um, to the Demers family, and, and I want to acknowledge that and thank people for that. Um, so certainly um, if you're able to give and you see that, go ahead and share that. Um, Mr. Steven shared uh, the link to our YouTube channel where you can see all of our current meetings. So thank you for that. So thank you to everyone. Um, I hope uh, his name is on this public um, event. Uh, Matt Eamon, thank you for um, setting that up and sharing that with all of us to be able to um, give to the Eamon family um, in some way. Uh, I'm sorry, to the um, to the Demers family. I know they are, are certainly um, appreciative of the outpouring that they've gotten. And again, I mentioned it earlier, um, the other victim of, of these um, tragic events um, ha has asked to remain anonymous. And so just continue to keep them um, in our thoughts. We um, began, I began yesterday, um, I began over the weekend, but in, in earnest yesterday as people were back in their offices working on setting up ways for us to offer services for anyone who needs to talk to someone about this. Anyone who um, has concerns, issues, might need any kind of um, crisis counseling, um, anything necessary. Our human services department is coordinating that. Um, so, um, so if you have a need um, and you don't know where to turn, we want you to know that we, we are here for you and we're going to, you know, help you find someone that can, can uh, work with you and talk with you. Um, all of uh, our schools, UConn has reached out and is, is helping with, um, they have very limited mental health uh, resources, which is, um, that's a topic for a different day under, uh, under uh, resourced area, um, but they have, are making resources available to us for any staff, student, um, or faculty at UConn. If you contact our office, we'll direct you if you don't already know that. It, um, our schools, both EO Smith and Willington schools, um, have um, reached out and shared with us names that we can share with you so that you have someone to talk to if your children are concerned. Um, we we want to make sure that people have resources that they need. So. Um, please, if you know someone who needs some help, um, please help us help them at the same time. And, um, you know, I, I welcome Liza and I both uh, have said it. I put out a statement as did Liza. Um, I want to hear your concerns. I, I want to hear your feedback, uh, positive and negative. We, we cannot know what you need if we do not hear from you and we have heard from you. Um, and, and we will, we will, um, work to develop a plan so that in the event something like this happens again, we don't find ourselves in the same situation. Um, if you're in the chat, um, Jenny Arpin, our Human Services Director, shared her phone number, 860-487-3118, is to the Human Services. Even when someone isn't in the building, we are checking uh, messages, so uh, feel free to leave a message or call another department in the town and we will get you connected with someone. Um, we, we are here for everyone, so thank you. Liza or John, um, do you have anything else uh, that you want to add going forward? This is not going to be the only conversation we have, but um, I, I felt it was important that we discuss this um, right away um, and, and start having a broad conversation, start putting something together. So Liza? Um, the only remaining thing I think is um, I think there were some very specific detailed questions in the, and it was hard to keep up with the Zoom chat. I apologize. Very. I have a hard time reading and talking and listening all at the same time. Um, so, uh, so I know that there were some very specific questions about some of the follow-up and the door-to-door -door checks and stuff like that. So is there going to be a mechanism for those questions being asked and answered maybe in a a slightly more efficient way so that um, Lieutenant Palmer can maybe respond to some of those individual um, questions that we can maybe share out. 
we can mm -hmm. try to share the document of the chat. I know some, um, it may seem like I skimmed over and didn't answer and I, all, some got by me, like Liza, I couldn't keep up with all of it. And some I know were very specific, you know, asking for specific details. Mm -hmm. um, and so my initial reactions, we wouldn't be able to answer that, but yeah. yes. Um, just like some of the uh, concerns you have here, um, we'll be sharing um, with, I'd like to share with Lieutenant Palmer, um, if he'll indulge us in some some very important reading, but in that were some of those really big concerns that we shared with you about how things were handled um, on your end inside the troop um, to our residents. So that that's going to be really important for us to hear back um, from you on that, that again, when we make those phone calls, we need to feel like someone really cares and is listening. Yeah, it's going to be one of the very first things I follow up with. Uh, I'm going to start tonight. Uh, well, actually, I need a little assistance from you all. Uh, sure. If you can kind of give me some idea of the time frame, that would be very helpful. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll be tasking someone with sitting and listening to the recording starting from Friday at, at uh, around 09 and moving forward. So if there's a way we can try to narrow it down, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, I will look at every question you provide me and at least be able to, to give you back uh, as you said, uh, you know, certain information we cannot share, but I want people to know that we've seen uh, their concerns. And if we can't answer that question, I want them to understand that that's just not anything we can answer and that we're not ignoring them. Uh, to that point, you, you made me aware of for the first time tonight during the meeting that uh, that response was what some people got from the barracks. That's going to be an immediate concern of mine uh, starting first thing in the morning when I get in and I am in early uh, trying to determine uh, who was on the phone and when the calls were made and, and uh, addressing that specifically. Yeah. I'm gonna share, I'll, I'll pull out um, those that uh, highlighted it. It may take me a while to sift through them and I'll get those to you specifically so you can take a look at, um, and then I'll try to respond um, if I had an email from those folks to see if they can share more detail um, with you so that we yeah, can and get it, to the bottom of that. It, there's no need for names involved. All I need okay. is a time. Time frame. Uh, a date and a time, and then that will be very helpful to try to narrow it down so we can, I can task the master sergeant with, with listening to those calls and saving them off and, uh, and determining uh, what action to take. Sure. Um, I am seeing a couple of questions here. I haven't addressed them too much, and, and our superintendent is on the line. This um, may be a bigger conversation uh, for the Board of Ed. But Phil, if you're able to at all, can you talk about protocols that are currently in place at the schools for an incident like this? Yeah, you can hear me. Are you dressed? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so Superintendent Phil Stevens, um, we do have protocols in place and, uh, you know, we obviously practice lockdowns. We do not share a lot of our protocols uh, because we do not want the majority of people knowing uh, how we are going to respond because if people know how we're going to respond, um, it doesn't help to practice those items. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, I think, you know, we learned after Sandy Hook, um, that all school districts needed a plan uh, and were mandated to have a plan and it's, it's, it's there. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, and, and I'm sure they may have a bigger conversation at the Board of Ed for how things um, were or weren't um, handled. Um, I'm going to apologize now, uh, Lieutenant Palmer, when you get the chat log that we share with you. Um, it's about as old school note taking as you can get. <laughs> Um, and there are a lot. That's quite all right. All I need, <laughs> I just need to know what people's concerns are, and I will do my yeah. best to address them. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. John, anything else you'd like to add? No, no I think we've had quite, quite a meeting tonight. Okay. Liza, going once, going twice. Lieutenant Palmer, anything you'd like to uh, leave us with? Uh, just assurances uh, along these lines. A, you will be hearing from us regards to the questions you have again. So you will know that we've heard your question even if we can't answer them in detail or specifically. Uh, please rest assured uh, that the town of Willington is as important to the, to the personnel at Troop C uh, as anywhere else in the area in which we work. Um, the, the troopers here, I'll say it again, they they take these things personally, whether it's uh, a stolen quad or something as, as, uh, as horrifying as this, 
we want to catch those people. We want to bring them to justice, and, and we are there for the town of Wellington. Uh, in this instance, there was there was a piece there that wasn't as robust as it should have been, and we will make the adjustment on that. But rest assured, the town of Wellington is well protected by the state police of Troop C, and we are committed to that. Um, I'll leave you with one um, note I saw several times through here as we talked about um, still being patrols through our area, folks feeling like they aren't seeing those. So, um, you know, we believe that there's a, an increase in patrols, um, but so, uh, you know, our folks are certainly watching for them. So if we can do anything to assure them that, um, that, that we are still out there and there is a presence um, until, uh, for sure, until this um, individual is captured. So, so we, we will take care of that. Thank, I want to thank everyone who, who joined this call, who shared their comments before, who shared um, in the comments for all. This is, this is conversation one of many to come. I've already, um, as we're sitting here, received emails of people who would like to participate in future conversation. Um, we can't have everyone, but we will have members of the community at large. I, you, know, you, you are part of why we do what we do. So thank you. Um, I appreciate Lieutenant Palmer. Um, thank you for taking the time um, to speak with us and be uh, as candid as, as you were able to. Um, and, and again, folks, um, if you're out uh, this evening, drive by and see um, what I'm sure will, will be a beautiful remembrance um, of Mr. Demers and for those that were hurt and, and please keep them in your thoughts, um, in your prayers, however that might be. Um, and, and stay safe and stay strong. And just because this meeting is over doesn't mean you can stop communicating and sharing your thoughts and concerns with us. Um, we're here. My, my door is open. However, not to the public, my email, my phone is. All right. Um, with that, I will move to adjourn at 8.12. Second. Second of my lies. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.